none of it would have happened without the troops president. Roosevelt called the lifeblood of America, the hope of the world. They left home barely more than boys and returned home heroes. But to their great credit, that is not how this generation carried itself. After the war, some put away their medals, were quiet about their service, moved on. Some, carrying shrapnel and scars, found that moving on was much harder. Many, like my grandfather, who served in Patton's army, lived a quiet life. Trading one uniform and set of responsibilities for another as a teacher, or a salesman, or a doctor, or an engineer, a dad, a grandpa. Our country made sure millions of them earned a college education. Opening up opportunity on an unprecedented scale. And they married those sweethearts and bought new homes and raised families and built businesses. Lifting up the greatest middle class the world has ever known. And through it all, they were inspired, I suspect, by memories of their fallen brothers. Memories that drove them to live their lives each day as best they possibly could. Whenever the world makes you cynical, stop and think of these men. Whenever you lose hope, stop and think of these men. Think of Wilson Caldwell who was told he couldn't pilot a plane without a high school degree. So he decided to jump out of a plane instead. And he did, here on D-Day with the 101st Airborne when he was just 16 years old. Think of Harry Koolkowitz, 
the Jewish son of Russian immigrants. Who fudged his age at enlistment so he could join his friends in the fight? And don't worry, Harry, the statute of limitations has expired. Harry came ashore at Utah Beach on D-Day. And now that he's come back. We said he could have anything he wants for lunch today he helped liberate this coast, after all. But he said a hamburger would do fine. What's more American than that? Think of Rock Merritt, who saw a recruitment poster asking him if He was man enough to be a paratrooper so he signed up on the spot. And that decision landed him here on D-Day with the 508th Regiment, a unit that would suffer heavy casualties. And 70 years later, it's said that all across Fort Bragg, they know Rock not just for his exploits on D-Day. Or his 35 years in the army, but because 91-year-old Rock Merritt still spends his time. Speaking to the young men and women of today's army and still bleeds O.D. Green for his 82nd Airborne. Whenever the world makes you cynical. Whenever you doubt that courage and goodness is possible stop and think of these men. Wilson and Harry and Rock, they are here today, and although I know we already gave them a rousing round of applause. Along with all our veterans of D-Day if you can stand, please stand, if not, please raise your hand. Let us recognize your service once more. These men waged war so that we might know peace. They sacrificed so that we might be free.
They fought in hopes of a day when we'd no longer need to fight. We are grateful to them. And, gentlemen, I want each of you to know that your legacy is in good hands. For in a time when it has never been more tempting to pursue narrow self-interest. To slough off common endeavor, this generation of Americans. A new generation our men and women of war have chosen to do their part as well. Rock, I want you to know that Staff Sergeant Melvin Sedillo Martin. who's here today, is following in your footsteps. He just had to become an American first because Melvin was born in Honduras. Moved to the United States. Join the army. After tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, he was reassigned to the 82nd Airborne. And Sunday, he'll parachute into Normandy. I became part of a family of real American heroes, he said. The paratroopers of the 82 ND. Wilson, you should know that Specialist Janice Rodriguez joined the Army not even two years ago. Was assigned to the 101st Airborne. and just last month earned the title of the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault Soldier of the Year. And that's inspiring but not surprising, when the women of today's military have taken on responsibilities. including combat, like never before. I want each of you to know that their commitment to their fellow service members and veterans endures. Sergeant First Class Brian Hawthorne's grandfather served under General Patton and General MacArthur. Brian himself served two tours in Iraq, 
earned the Bronze Star in Baghdad for saving the life of his best friend. And today, he and his wife use their experience to help other veterans and military families navigate theirs. And Brian is here in Normandy to participate in Sunday's jump. And here, just yesterday, he re-enlisted in the Army Reserve. And this generation this 9-11 generation of service members they, too, felt something. They answered some call, they said I will go. They, too, chose to serve a cause that's greater than self. Many even after they knew they'd be sent into harm's way. And for more than a decade, they have endured tour after tour. Sergeant First Class Corey Remsburg has served 10. And I've told Corey's incredible story before. Most recently when he sat with my wife, Michelle, at the State of the Union address. It was here, at Omaha Beach, on the 65th anniversary of D-Day. where I first met Corey and his fellow army rangers, right after they made their own jump into Normandy. The next time I saw him, he was in the hospital. Unable to speak or walk after an IED nearly killed him in Afghanistan. But over the past five years, Corey has grown stronger, learning to speak again and stand again and walk again. And earlier this year, he jumped out of a plane again. The first words Corey said to me after his accident echoed those words. First shouted all those years ago on this beach, Rangers lead the way.
So Corey has come back today, along with Melvin and Janice and Brian. And many of their fellow active duty service members. We thank them for their service. They are a reminder that the tradition represented by these gentlemen continues. We are on this earth for only a moment in time. And fewer of us have parents and grandparents to tell us about what the veterans of D-Day did here 70 years ago. As I was landing on Marine One, I told my staff, I don't think there's a time where I miss my grandfather more. Where I'd be more happy to have him here, than this day. So we have to tell their stories for them. We have to do our best to uphold in our own lives the values that they were prepared to die for. We have to honor those who carry forward that legacy. Recognizing that people cannot live in freedom unless free people are prepared to die for it. And as today's wars come to an end, this generation of servicemen and women will step out of uniform. And they, too, will build families and lives of their own. They, too, will become leaders in their communities, in commerce, in industry. And perhaps politics the leaders we need for the beachheads of our time. And, God willing, they, too, will grow old in the land they help to keep free. And someday, future generations, whether 70 or 700 years hence. will gather at places like this to honor them and to say that these were generations of men and women who proved once again that they United States of America is and will remain the greatest force for freedom the world has ever known.
May God bless our veterans and all who served with them, including those who rest here in eternal peace. And may God bless all who serve today for the peace and security of the world. May God bless the people of France. And may God bless our United States of America. Barack Obama Remarks on the Debt Compromise Agreement Delivered July 31, 2011, James S. Brady Briefing Room, The White House Good evening. There are still some very important votes to be taken by members of Congress. But I want to announce that the leaders of both parties, in both chambers, have reached an agreement that will reduce. the deficit and avoid default a default that would have had a devastating effect on our economy. The first part of this agreement will cut about $1 trillion in spending over the next 10 years cuts that both parties had agreed to early on in this process. The result would be the lowest level of annual domestic spending since Dwight Eisenhower was president. but at a level that still allows us to make job-creating investments in things like education and research. We also made sure that these cuts wouldn't happen so abruptly that they'd be a drag on a fragile economy. Now, I've said from the beginning that the ultimate solution to our deficit problem must be balanced. Despite what some Republicans have argued, I believe that we have to ask the wealthiest Americans. and biggest corporations to pay their fair share by giving up tax breaks and special deductions. Despite what some in my own party have argued, 
I believe that we need to make some modest. Adjustments to programs like Medicare to ensure that they're still around for future generations.